when you get bad sleep, it eventually can lead to absolutely worse morbidity and mortality. Do everything possible you can to breathe better through your nose, and you actually can see improvement in your sleep within a week, within two weeks, sometimes within a night. And by the enrollment phase, we had 187 women, 169 of them, in all probability, had sleep apnea, in addition to having chronic nightmares. Why does sleep affect those things? What is happening when we're sleeping? And also what is happening when we're dreaming or having nightmares? Dr. Barry Krako, how do you define quality sleep? Quality sleep is the be all end all metric of trying to understand sleep problems. So it's a great first question, really appreciate starting off in that realm because so many people believe that sleep quantity, the number of hours you get is where all the action is. And it is true that some people don't get enough sleep and they have to work on that. But the largest problem in sleep today that people are suffering from is in fact sleep quality problems. So instead of answering your question about what it is in terms of it's how good it can be, let's say, let's first talk about why it's so bad in so many people and what that actually means. Because most people aren't even thinking about what sleep quality means. Um, and if they were, because of this tendency we all have to normalize our own behavior, we would just say, oh, this must be normal. It's kind of like nasal breathing. Many people have stuffy noses, congested noses, and you ask them, well, how's your nasal breathing? And they go, my nasal breathing is just fine, as they sit there mouth breathing, talking to you. And you're going, well, how is it they don't recognize that? And the answer is that they normalize the behavior. So poor sleep quality is associated with so many things that if a person heard it, they might say, well, how could that be possible? I mean, isn't that, this sounds like this guy's talking about depression or he's talking about heart disease, or he's talking about uh, a neurologic condition. Well, in fact, that's right. That's what happens when you don't sleep well. You get all of those problems. You obviously start, and most importantly, you start by not having energy. So quality of sleep could simply be defined as that level of sleep depth and consolidation that gives you the normal amount of energy you need to function during the day. And then the caveat, of course, would be, but can I still have my cup of coffee in the morning? And the answer to that question is, yes, you can. But amongst those people who truly have normal sleep, which means truly normal sleep quality, they are not likely to be caffeine users. You said, let's start with basically the lack of quality sleep. So what, what are people doing that is causing them to not get the sleep that they would be better off get the, the sleep that is most optimal for them? What they're doing is largely not observing that this problem they're having that you just described, they're not observing the nature of the sleep experience. Let me give you a few examples. And one of the best ones is trips to the bathroom at night. And you go to a sleep doctor, if you go to a urologist, you go to a gynecologist, you ask, how many times can I wake up at night to pee? and have it still be normal. Virtually all these doctors will say, particularly above the age of 40, 
I'm sorry, the, the, the individuals above the age of 40, not the doctors, um, normal is one to two. So one to two times a night, you can wake up to pee once you get over the age of 40. Well, I used to think that that was normal. <laughs> and then I discovered that sleep apnea actually causes trips to the bathroom at night. And so in our research center in Albuquerque, New Mexico, for many years, we would see people come into treatment complaining that they were using CPAP and not getting a good response. We said, okay, well, we're going to switch you to a different device called bi-level, which just means, by the way, CPAP means one pressure, bi-level means breathing in and breathing out, two different pressures. It's easier to use. It's more effective. And so in these people who came to see us, most of them were waking up at night between one and four times a night. When we got them in the sleep lab and we got them finely attuned, finely tuned uh, with their pressure settings, they stopped going to the bathroom at night. So how is that possible that you could eliminate somebody's trips to the bathroom and now you still want to tell me that a 60 or 70 year old person who doesn't wake up at night to pee because they're using a pap machine. Now you want to tell me that one to two is normal when that person no longer gets up. So that's, that's what I mean by the self-observation. Just to clarify, you're saying that people who change the way that they breathe while they're sleeping, it affected the amount of times that they wake up in the middle of the night to use the restroom. Absolutely. And, and the, the scientific evidence on this is crystal clear. Uh, I have a video on my website, barrycracomd.com, that just a five minute video that shows that sleep apnea literally goes through a cardiovascular process while you're sleeping that forces the right atrium of your heart to release its own diuretic into the system during the night, which therefore makes the kidneys make more urine and therefore makes you wake up and pee more. If you treat the sleep apnea with a pap machine or a dental device or surgery, you know, whatever your treatment turns out to be, that process is completely eliminated. And so you don't secrete a diuretic in the middle of the night. Now, the question then is, should we say that nocturia, that's the word for trips to the bathroom at night, should we say that nocturia is an indication that you are sleeping poorly? And the answer is absolutely it is. Now, could there be other reasons for nocturia? Sure, you could be on a medication. You could uh, have a prostate problem. You could have a bladder problem. And all of that's true. And I'm not discounting it. You could even claim it's, I drink too much water at bedtime. Mm -hmm. But what I'm trying to say is, I've seen all those cases. I've seen all those excuses or rationalizations or good explanations. And I was stunned by the time, the number of times. People would say, well, my doctor told me I had a prostate problem. But now I don't wake up at night to pee. So are you telling me I don't have a prostate problem? I say, no. I'm telling you, you probably have an enlarged prostate, but that probably was not the cause of why you were waking up at night to pee. The sleep apnea was probably the cause. Okay, so someone has a prostate problem, a bladder problem, they drank a lot of water before bedtime, but they fixed their breathing while they're sleeping, and now they're getting the quality sleep that they actually need. And now their body, I'm, I'm assuming, is able to start correcting those other problems. Exactly. Now, one of the funniest things about this, but it's also very uh, motivating, is that nocturia is one of the easiest things to treat when you treat sleep apnea. So let's just say there's like a treatment for sleep apnea that I really want to get the person way up here with the best possible treatment where their brain is functioning so much better and their sleepiness is like nearly eliminated. I only have to treat them to about here and the nocturia will go away. So for some people that's like, wow, I'm using my CPAP machine or whatever machine 
And I'm already making progress because my trips to the bathroom are getting better. But you know what? I'm still having some memory problems. I'm still sleepy during the day. I'm, I still have low energy. What do I do, doc? And the answer, of course, is we have to figure out what's a better treatment. You know, is it they need higher pressure of CPAP? Do they need a bi-level device? Or is it something else? I mean, the complexities of treating sleep quality usually boil down to only a few things. But nonetheless, it's not as if you just suddenly make one simple change and then you're done. Many people with these problems take up to a year to get to the highest quality sleep they can reach. And then it takes definite um, diligence on their part and their doctor's part to keep working at it to maintain that level. I've been through it myself for the last, um, going on 26 years now, starting out with a dental device for a few years. A dental device holds your jaw forward so you get more air through the back of your throat and you wear this dental device all night long, obviously. And then I've been on a PAP machine for about um, the last 23 years, I think. Mm. Plot twist, uh, we're actually talking about breathing, not sleeping. Um, no, I actually <laughs> want to hear about your journey and how you got interested in this. You've written five books about sleep. So what is your background? Well, um, the good Lord put me in a situation where I ended up as an emergency medicine doctor, an internal medicine doctor, where I suddenly found myself in 1988 working with a group of psychiatrists on developing a treatment for chronic nightmares. Mm. And there's no other explanation for that than divine providence. And ever since 1988, my entire career path has been working with mental health patients who have sleep problems. And it's because I had the background in emergency medicine and internal medicine. It gave me such a different and broader perspective about looking at patients with sleep problems that as I began learning about mental health, psychiatry, psychology, and so forth, I began to see things that made more sense to me than it did to many of the psychiatrists and psychologists I was working with. And basically, in this treatment that we developed for nightmares called imagery rehearsal therapy, or IRT, we were working on this all through the 1990s, eventually published a paper in JAMA. It was the first randomized controlled trial published to demonstrate that if you treat a sleep problem, you actually decrease psychiatric distress. In this case, these were rape survivors, all women who had moderate to severe PTSD. When we treated their nightmares, their PTSD got better. And so that was published in 2001. So that was a whole career pathway that I started on. But that's not the career pathway that it necessarily led me to. Now, why does that, why does sleep affect those things? What is happening when we're sleeping and also what is happening when we're dreaming or having nightmares? Well, that's the discovery that was a two part aspect here. Number one, dreaming is something that we have much more control over than we thought. And I'm not just talking about something called lucid dreaming, which is where people have awareness of their dreaming while they're dreaming. That's a more isolated type of experience. I'm talking about imagery rehearsal therapy, where if you simply work on some images during the daytime, there's a very good chance you're going to influence the images at night. I'm not saying they have to repeat themselves. I'm not saying you think about this during the day and so you dream about that at night, some of that does occur. But with IRT, we had people take their nightmares, change them, picture new dreams, and that led to the decrease of their nightmares. So that told us that nightmares are likely to be 
some type of learned behavior. And so this IRT process is an unlearning of that learned behavior. So that was one really big insight. By the way, many psychiatrists and psychologists today don't believe that. They insist that nightmares must represent something very important. You have to do psychotherapy. You have to do dream therapy. Um, some of that actually can be true. Many psychiatrists just offer pills for nightmares because they haven't learned IRT. But among certain niche markets in psychology and sleep medicine, IRT is the number one treatment for nightmares because it's drug-free. It's easy to use. It's easy to learn. Um, and that's a wonderful thing. But the shocker that came to us in the 1990s was the actual discovery that nearly all the patients that we were seeing in that study, uh, which if you just start with the enrollment phase, where we're working with people, some don't complete the project, but by the enrollment phase, we had 187 women, 169 of them in all probability had sleep apnea in addition to having chronic nightmares. And over the years then, we began are, publishing... Oh, go are ahead. Those, are those two things linked? I think so. That's what I think. I'll, I'll give you a, a story why. Uh, we kept publishing data because of our mental health interest, experience, and so forth. Our sleep center would keep seeing mental health patients come in because they knew... That's what our center was. People would come to us from all over the country, sometimes from all over the world. And we would publish this data saying, we're finding rates of 90% of sleep apnea in PTSD patients. This doesn't make any sense. What the heck is going on? And over the years, others started publishing similar things. Their rates would be 30%. Somebody else would say 60%. But all these numbers are crazy high. Like, why would a group with a mental health disorder have such high rates of sleep apnea? And I believe the number is very high. And I'll put it this way. If you're a PTSD patient and you have sleep problems that are not resolving or have not responded well, the chances of sleep apnea in that picture are clearly between 80 and 90%. And so, Getting to your question, we and others, we published, the, we published the second paper in 2000. Somebody published one in 1998, and then others are publishing now. There's nine studies in the scientific literature right now. They're not great studies, but nine studies actually show that if you give a nightmare patient a pap machine, you will decrease their nightmares with the pap machine. So pap therapy treating sleep apnea is decreasing nightmares. Now, why would the body, why would the body not want to be in a deep sleep in order to heal the PTSD? I feel like if you have some sort of depression or anything of that nature, a lot of healing happens when we're sleeping. And I feel like the body would want to be in that deep sleep why why would our why wouldn't it correct the breathing in order for that to happen or is something else going on where the breathing needs to needs more attention it can't self correct that is one of the most brilliant statements i've heard on a podcast that 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 is so spot on because you would think the body would have some self corrective mechanism but what's happening is, and we don't know all of this for sure, but I'll give you sort of a working theory of where people think this may be headed. When you have PTSD, you're obviously hyper alert. You're hyper aroused. You're hyper vigilant. You've just been assaulted, attacked, injured. You know, whatever the trauma is. You don't get to snap your fingers and make that go away. You don't, you don't like rub some dirt on it and suddenly you're all better. This is one of these things that goes deep into the core of your body and your mind. When you sleep, you now suffer what's called hyperarousal induced sleep fragmentation. 
So sleep has to be consolidated for it to work. For it to get deep, it has to be consolidated. If you fragment it, it can't get deep, but far worse, far, far worse. And this is just a working theory. It's 30 years old. It's from some researchers in Canada. Nobody's come along to challenge the theory. They Nobody knows what to make of it. But they took normal sleepers and fragmented their sleep. Just one night of fragmented sleep. And the next night, they could measure changes in their breathing. Meaning fragmented, meaning they woke them up periodically? Hundreds of times without them knowing it. With a little, you know, uh, what do you call it? A, a bell tone. It's a bell tone experiment. And the person arouses, but they're not going to remember they woke up. Well, PTSD patients are waking up hundreds of times a night already. So do we think that the PTSD then caused the sleep apnea? Because it creates the fragmentation, which then makes your breathing not stable. Nobody, nobody knows. Everybody is so up in the air on this because people keep saying, well, that's like everybody with PTSD then is going to get sleep apnea. Well, that maybe isn't true, but it's just so cloudy. My view has been, I don't know. I would like to know, but I want to treat the sleep breathing because I know if I treat the sleep breathing in a PTSD patient, they're going to get benefits beyond anything they imagine. And so many PTSD patients suffer horribly because they're not told any of this information. Yeah, it's almost like what came first, the chicken or the egg? Like, does everyone's sleep apnea have some sort of trauma or depression or vice versa? And, you know, I guess by by treating the sleep apnea, that's one method uh, that works that can essentially, um, it's like when you go to heal one thing, other things actually right. heal at the same time. Unbelievably so. Well, in the case of sleep disorder breathing, you're talking about, um, the damage to the brain, the damage to the heart, the damage really to most organ systems of the body are occurring nightly. Um, and therefore, you are treating a multi-system disease disorder when you treat sleep apnea. Obviously, it's good to get the right amount of oxygen. Obviously, it's good to get the right amount of sleep consolidation. And those two things, when they're done, sleep consolidation and normal oxygenation, the sky is almost the limit in what things can be improved. I won't use the, you use the word cure because many things obviously have their own etiologies that are different. But there's no question that this plays a huge, huge, totally under the radar um, impact on human health that most people in the world, most doctors, most healthcare professionals, most mental health professionals do not get by any stretch of the imagination. And truly it's killing us because when you get bad sleep, it eventually can lead to absolutely worse morbidity and mortality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't think of two more important things when it comes to our health besides breathing and sleeping. I would like to know your thoughts on melatonin, magnesium, chamomile tea, breath work. Right. So unfortunately, the research on these things is rarely done in ways that gives you confidence about well, this has been proven. You know, here's the evidence, something like that. On the other hand, my career in medicine was preceded by uh, eight years working in the natural food business. So I was exposed to all sorts of alternative healing methodologies in the 1970s before I went to medical school. And I realized then, and I realized later as a, as a physician, and I realize now that 
we are finally moving into the realm of what's called personally tailored medicine. And that means for each person, regardless of what any randomized controlled study says, each person may discover, well, melatonin or chamomile may work for me. And so that leads you to a place where you can only do trial and error and find out. And I encourage that because it is very frustrating to try to solve these sleep problems, especially when you're working with sleep centers that tend to be very, uh, you know, unidimensional and don't have a lot of to say, a lot to offer, except a few different therapies, some of which are very good, but many people do need some of these additional things. Um, but the place where this topic leads me is in the areas of insomnia and restless legs and leg jerks, because the people who have those two problems, the leg movement problem and the insomnia problem, they are most likely going down these pathways because they're convinced of one of two things. It's a psychological problem. And so maybe these things could help. Maybe they'll calm me down. Or it's actually a biological problem. Maybe there's something missing in my, my neurotransmitters and I don't really want to try sleeping pills because I've heard bad things and that's correct. There's some very dangerous side effects to sleeping pills. And most people don't stay on sleeping pills. They, they want to get off of them. And sleeping pills, you know, many of them or several of them certainly can be causing brain damage. Um, on that note, that I, I have just one example of someone mm -hmm. who on uh, sleeping meds, prescription sleeping meds, I don't remember the name, but he would wake up in the middle of the night and he would eat, he would walk around, he would do different things and have no recollection at all whatsoever. Right. This led up to, I mean, it, it just continued until he one day went, got in his car one night. He woke up in the middle of the night, got in his car, he went, he drove and he hit someone, that person died. Has no recollection. Yeah, that's Ambien. That's the drug Ambien. It could have been, yeah. Well, that's usually, I mean, that's, that's, that's how they've got these black box, black box warnings on these drugs now, I believe, uh, because this, this, the nocturnal eating, uh, the driving, these stories came out not that long ago. I think it's in the last decade where this was happening. And so, yeah, it's it's horrific when this stuff happens. And obviously, people will be very nervous to, to do something. So, so they do, though, think about, is there a biological thing? And here's what I want to get across. Insomnia and restless legs and leg jerks are very complicated processes. But here is the bottom line that, again, is shocking. The proportion of people with insomnia who have struggled to solve the problem, like they've tried different pills, they've tried different therapies, and nothing seems to work or work well, nearly all of them have either sleep apnea or they have restless legs and leg jerks. So they're going down this pathway for years trying to solve their insomnia to start with, thinking, well, it's psychological or it's biological. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Nobody ever said to them, go get a sleep study. And this is where I go back to your first question. If a person with insomnia would observe the quality of their sleep and not just fixate on the problems of sleep duration, if they observe the quality of their sleep and they go, all right, well, let me do a checklist here. Uh, do I wake up in the morning with headaches? Uh, do I wake up with a dry mouth? Do I wake up at night and roll over a lot? Do I toss and turn a lot? Am I tired during the day? Am I sleepy sometimes during the day? Um, does the doctor say my blood pressure is borderline high? Do I notice problems with memory, attention, and concentration? You've just described a class of patient with sleep apnea. Mm. And so a person who's got insomnia is going to take all that information and go, well, that's because I only got three hours sleep last night. I say, well, you could be right. I'm not going to say you're, 
you're wrong, but I don't ever want you to be dead wrong. And so I want to find out what else is going on with your sleep. In younger populations, like in their teens and 20s, it is true, lots of things can just be about insufficient sleep. But it is remarkable. We, 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 this, this study, this um, idea was developed in 1973 by Dr. Christian Guimano at Stanford University. He was, up until 2019, the leading sleep researcher in the world. I had the great fortune to train with him in 1993 for a mini fellowship. He discovered that sleep apnea causes insomnia. Our research team and another in Alabama got involved with this kind of research in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And we've been publishing papers like crazy on the link between insomnia and sleep apnea. And in five years ago, we published our biggest paper in a Lancet journal showing that if you treat hardcore chronic insomniacs who've tried all kinds of medications, who are failing their treatment, and who absolutely don't believe they have sleep apnea, if you treat them with specialized sleep apnea treatments, one is called ASV, it's a kind of bi-level device, you get 70% cure rate. These people walked in the door and they said, well, yeah, I have insomnia. I'm interested in your research study, but I don't have sleep apnea. Okay, good. That's who we want. Now let's do a diagnostic study. Guess what? You do have sleep apnea. And they're going, are you kidding me? You're telling me I've had this for 10 or 20 years and this has been causing my insomnia? Well, let's find out. Let's treat you and see what happens. Now, just to completely clarify the difference of those two things, insomnia, you're not able to fall asleep or you're- Or stay asleep. Or stay asleep. And with sleep apnea, it's your breathing that you're breathing through your mouth. And the key to understanding sleep apnea is that it's unfortunate that we have to call it sleep distorted breathing because we say, oh, it must be a breathing disorder. It's actually a brain disorder because those breathing interruptions do what? They wake you up all night long. So your brain looks highly fragmented in terms of highly consolidated. I'm just talking about, you know, EEG, electroencephalographic brain waves, should look very rhythmical, so to speak. And schematically in my book, I can't remember if we're doing video or audio only, but no. In, in my book, I've got graphics that actually show the way the brain waves should be looking and the way they are looking when you have sleep disordered breathing and what happens when you treat the breathing disorder. And so when that happens, you now have this consolidated sleep. Okay. Now, how much does this make a difference? What time you go to sleep and what you do before you go to sleep? Well, if we're talking about classic insomnia, which would mean in my definition, not most other people's, but my definition, classic insomnia means there is no other breathing disorder. There's just classic insomnia. It's all psychological. I will say this to be very clear. That is a rare condition. Unless you're talking about acute insomnia where people get temporarily and then it, then it goes away, which is very common, by the way. Um, Therefore, in a classic insomniac, absolutely what you do in the evening, what you do at bedtime, what happens with your schedule, all those things are discussed in my book. And they get into the concept of the body does like a routine. And if you help the body with that routine, then you're going to end up with less insomnia. The reason, however, and I wrote this in my earlier book, Sound Sleep, Sound Mind, the reason insomniacs can't do what you're saying is they have unfinished business. They cannot actually gain what I call emotional closure at the end of the day. So their day for them, amongst virtually 95% of insomniacs I've met, maybe higher, all of them suffer 
from some degree of frustration or anger or both about what's going on in their life. Could be a relationship, <clears throat> could be work, could be just dissatisfaction with, you know, career development, could be with family members, could be with children, whatever it is. I'm not saying they have horrible relationships. I'm saying their ability to process their frustrations and their angers regarding these, you know, um, things in their life is just not at a high level. And so when they get to the evening time, they might say, oh, well, it's time to go to bed. <laughs> well, that's great that you think it's time to go to bed. But what does a sleep doctor ask? Are you sleepy? And if you're not sleepy, why are you going to bed? You're just going to lie there and toss and turn and have racing thoughts. So in both my books, Life Saving Sleep and Sound Sleep Sound Mind, I describe this process of, well, how do you how do you work on unfinished business and how do you make a decision to not go into the bedroom and it starts with a key principle that we love and we continue to use and i've been training psychiatry residents here in savannah ask the person do you know the difference between what it means to be tired or what it means to be sleepy because most people who have chronic insomnia who are not doing well who've tried medications and so forth they don't know the difference between the two feelings of tired and sleepy. If someone needs to be sleepy or needs is the wrong word. If you're saying that it's better that someone be sleepy before they go to bed, then won't they just stay up and say, okay, I'm not sleepy yet. So I'm going to continue watching TV or scrolling on my phone, basically staring at a screen and then that blue light and that hyperactivity in their brain is going to keep them from not being sleepy. And isn't it like a catch 22 or do they need to intentionally maybe read a book or take a walk? Yeah. All great scenarios you're describing and they all can happen. And obviously if that worst case happens, that's a candidate for a sleeping pill. That person has to consider that possibility. So what happens is, if you have the patient that has zero sleepiness, they go, I don't know what sleepiness is. I don't experience it. That patient unequivocally must see a sleep specialist. They often need to see a psychiatrist too. So that's how intense that particular problem is. In sleep medicine, 20 years of running a sleep center, the total number of people with that problem is less than a dozen probably two dozen at the most most people have some little bit of sleepiness how do we know this because they might doze off during the day or they might say well i doze off in church or i dozed off at a theater or i doze off literally just sitting at uh, a traffic light and you go well how could that happen he said well oh because i didn't get enough sleep Okay, well, yes, that's fair. That may be part of the problem. But don't you see, that's at least teaching you, you experience the feeling of sleepiness. So now, how do we um, transform your whole waking experience so you can move all that sleepiness to the bedtime? Mm -hmm. And once a person hears that, they go, oh, okay, I don't know how easy this is going to be, but I see what you mean now. I do possess that feeling of sleepiness. I just am recruiting it at the wrong time of day. And you're going to teach me now how to get it there at bedtime or, you know, soon thereafter. So stop that cycle by skipping your nap one day and just suffering through being tired so that you're able to have a normal night's sleep. That's, that's the skinny version. And as the, as the insomnia is increasingly complex, you'll find some people who will say, I already do that. I, I, I don't nap because I, I know that's going to be a problem. I say, well, that's great. So what's the problem? And the problem is that the way their brain is working, they're not connecting the dots between this idea of unfinished business 
which leads to racing thoughts, which leads to no sleepiness. So now you come back to, well, what could they do differently? I mean, could they do breathing exercises? Absolutely. I'm just about to um, post something on my Substack newsletter, fastasleep.substack.com, where they're talking about muscle training, breathing muscle training on expiration actually decreases sleep apnea. So all kinds of breathing trainings have been described to help with insomnia. All I can say is these are all great things to do. Breathing trainings and breathing exercises are great things to do, but they are not necessarily always so consistently effective for insomniacs. They're more consistent for saying it helps you to relax, it's good for your health, it improves your mental outlook. But for insomnia, it's definitely more inconsistent in part because so many people have other things going on with that insomnia. How do you feel about devices like Whoop or the Apple Watch as far as measuring sleep? Can that be beneficial in helping with this? These devices are great and hopefully they're going to take over so that we can get sleep centers to finally pay attention to more data that they just don't want to look at. And what I mean by that is these devices eventually may have the capacity to gather on all the EEG information, more subtle breathing events. Right now, they're not anywhere near that level. So the good news about them is, one, some of them can actually give you a qualitative assessment that says, no, your sleep quality doesn't look so good. You need to get a further evaluation. So they give you that potential. Some of them can also give you information like you may have sleep apnea. So this is fantastic. But I'm talking about way down the road, hopefully not way down the road, but sooner, where they make it so good, a person won't even have to go to a sleep center. They'll actually get the diagnosis and they'll be able to go to their primary care doctor and say, well, I did this, you know, Apple Watch thing and it, here's what it showed. I would like you to write my prescription for my CPAP machine. And because of the way medicine is floundering in so many areas, it does great in many areas, but it's floundering in certain areas, especially administratively, this would be a fantastic opportunity in sleep medicine where people could get their own testing done cheaply, get a diagnosis, and then what will probably ha end up happening is they'll, they'll go back to a very old-fashioned model of sleep medicine where sleep techs used to run sleep centers. This is back in the 1980s. And then sleep techs could just meet with that person. I got my, I got my Apple Watch. Uh, you sell PAP machines. My doctor gave me a prescription. Get me started. The sleep tech, by the way, is much more skilled at teaching the patient how to use a CPAP machine most sleep doctors have nothing compared to what a sleep tech can do in teaching a patient. So that model of care would save millions of dollars, enormous amounts of time, and then sleep centers could finally concentrate on very complex cases of which there are millions who need tremendous levels of care and lots more testing in the sleep lab. What advice can we give to the listeners so that they can get a better night's sleep tonight while they wait for your book to be delivered. <laughs> well, you're bringing me to this area that I talk about in the book several places and which I have been, been training the psychiatry residents on. And it's a model I've been adopted, adopting in the last stages of my sleep center and now over the last several years here in Savannah. It's called Early Conservative Treatment of Sleep Disordered Breathing. And so what it comes down to is, if you have a listener out there who's complaining about their sleep, there's a very good chance they've got a sleep quality problem. Now, they may not. Some of them may say, well, I'm young and I'm strictly psychological and it's just insomnia. And OK, fine, you're going to have to wait for the book. <laughs> but I want to address those people that if they take a little bit of self-observation and they go, well, I do wake up at night to pee. 
I do wake up sometimes with a morning headache. I do wake up with a dry mouth. I don't feel refreshed when I wake up in the morning. All right, you've got a sleep quality problem. Early conservative treatment of sleep disordered breathing is very simple. It's working on nasal hygiene. Do everything possible you can to breathe better through your nose, and you actually can see improvement in your sleep within a week, within two weeks, sometimes within a night. So I'll give you some quick examples. On my website, barrycrakomd.com, there's a free video series on nasal hygiene. It's called the nose, N-O-S-E, nose, K-N-O-W-S. And it talks about there's all these factors in nasal breathing, again, people don't pay attention to because many people with sleep quality problems have conditions called allergic and non-allergic rhinitis, which just means you have multiple reasons for having congestion, stuffiness, runny nose. So the very first thing we tell patients in this situation, go buy nasal saline. Rinse your nose out several times during the day, not at bedtime, but several times during the day and notice what you get out and do it for at least a week, maybe two weeks. Virtually any patient who came to us who did that comes back and says, how, how is it I'm sleeping better? I'm just squirting this stuff in my nose. I'm blowing my nose. I'm getting junk out. You were right. My nose is not as clear as I thought it was. And now they're breathing through their nose. So if that were true, that means that person could start using a nasal strip. They could use nasal dilators. They could say, maybe I shouldn't sleep on my back. They could say, maybe I should sleep in a cooler room. I'm describing all the things that make your breathing better. So a person could do all of that tonight. They could do some of it, not all of it, but some of it tonight. And over the next two weeks, do a lot of it. You'll have people, we would see people do this stuff and they were like, their mind was so blown. They go, well, I'm not coming back to see you for a sleep test or sleep apnea and all that because I am so good right now. I'm sticking with this and I'll, I'll call you guys later. And so some of them would wait. They'd come back a year later, say, okay, I've, I've done great for a year, but now I can see I want even more. Mm. It's been very exciting. Yeah, I've plateaued and I'm ready for the next level. Right, right, right. And so it's such an easy way to start. And, the, and the, uh, the benefit is so easy with one exception, one caveat. Many people in this situation are what's, what I call skin sensitive. And when they try to learn to use nasal strips or when they try to use nasal dilators or even when they try to use nasal sprays, they can have side effects. They don't like the taste of the nasal spray. They find it, uh, it makes it itchy on their nose. They find it irritates. I'm not saying I disbelieve them. I'm just saying they're sensitive. And that sensitivity is absolutely a potential for a barrier. And so a person has to ask the question, well, what could I do differently? You know, and I tell people, for example, with nasal dilators, which are the hardest thing to get used to, I say, never use those at night until you've actually taken a nap with them during the day and proven to yourself that you can use it. It's not uncomfortable. It doesn't cause pain. And of course, there's so many nasal dilators out there. This person may have to buy five before they figure out which one they can use that is comfortable. You're bringing up a lot of old memories for me that I had buried. I actually had a deviated septum and I couldn't breathe out of one of my nostrils. So I had surgery on it. And since then, I mean, I don't have any issue at all with breathing or with sleeping or breathing while I sleep. But um, back when I did, before I had that fixed, I was using those nasal sprays. Um, right. I got some of the nose strips mm -hmm. and it was awful. Yeah, yeah. And do you remember, by the way, whether it helped? Because some people with deviated septum, those devices didn't work. Occasionally they work. But um, what was your experience? Yeah, the, the sprays helped. I don't know. I don't remember exactly what they were. Something maybe like Flonase. Right. Yeah, it's a common one. 
Yeah, um, that would help. But I, it was almost like I was like I needed it after a while. Like I became dependent on it. Well, I don't know if dependent is exactly the right word. If it turned out you really had developed a rhinitis condition called allergic rhinitis, usually like hay fever, then that is treating it. You don't say technically a diabetic is dependent on insulin. You say they have to have insulin and you have to treat the condition. Mm -hmm. There's many different sprays out there. And I'll mention one that's very interesting because it's more recent development, xylitol nasal spray. I know people have a scare about xylitol research just that came out. I don't, I don't know what to make of that, but xylitol nasal sprays often help clear up the nasal passages and that's over the counter. Yeah, I mean, those are some great tips and those are things that people can definitely do tonight. So thank you for sharing those. Sure. I have two questions that I ask at the end, but before I do, where can people go that want to learn more? Where can they go to buy your book? Sure. Thank you. Um, my website is barrycracomd.com. And on that website, there's many books. Uh, there's many videos. Uh, there's books for insomnia, books for nightmares. And on that site, I also have professional sleep health coaching services. So that is particularly helpful for people with chronic insomnia who've not been able to figure out a plan and for people who've tried PAP therapy and have not been able to use it successfully. Those are the two most kinds of clients that I will see when we do these coaching experiences. And most people do find they get tremendous benefit uh, from engaging with me uh, on that platform. Um, my books are also sold on Amazon and wherever books are sold. So you can get them that way. Uh, my Substack, as I mentioned, is fastasleep.substack.com. And I post on there a few times a month on latest research, some of the podcasts I've done, uh, updating information that I think you know might be interesting and relevant. Um, and then as far as that goes, I think, I think that covers it really do appreciate you having me on. Great. Yeah, it's been great. Um, all that will be linked in the, in the description, of course, and Dr. Barry Craco, what is your number one health tip? So whether that is diet, mindset, nutrition, physical, emotional, just the one piece of advice you would like everyone to know. When you say, I have to ask, do you mean like no as in know this information or as no and do this action? Oh, I, I was, when I framed it, it was know this information, but it could be an action. Well, what comes to mind about no would be know that it is so difficult to try to understand your sleep when everybody in the media keeps telling you it's all about the number of hours of sleep. Try to erase that from your mind because it's hard to do that and embrace the concept of sleep quality. And that is absolutely the number one health tip in terms of knowledge. In terms of treatment, it's really make the commitment that you want to improve your sleep quality. Because as I said at the outset, and let me show it again in a different way, many people will treat their sleep quality and go, wow, I'm doing this. There's a sleep doctor. I know they might be up here, but they have a hard time understanding that unless they're working with somebody professionally who says, no, you can get better sleep quality. Let's try to get you there. I have another sleep question before I ask you the final question. Are there really morning people and night people or are we best off if we all follow the sun and in, in our circadian rhythm? Absolutely. There are um, 
night owls and morning larks. There, there's no question about it. However, it is likely that some of the night owls have been influenced by things other than circadian rhythms. In other words, if you get insomnia long enough, you could just become a night owl. It doesn't have to be the reverse, like, oh, no, you were really a night owl. No, it could be because when somebody treats their insomnia very effectively, they may discover that their bedtime starts getting earlier than they thought and their wake up time gets earlier. So, but yes, biologically, it's true. It's important to know. And some people have that problem and it has to be addressed if it poses a problem. It doesn't have to be a problem. Interesting. For my final question, you get to choose a number one through 100 and it will be personal. Oh, so you tell me the number. <laughs> it's always got to be 18. 18. Chai. Chai. This is a good one. To life. To to life. That's the eighteenth the the uh eighteenth letter of the alphabet. Am I saying that? No, I'm sorry. The number chai represents eighteen, and that is to life in Hebrew. Oh, okay. Number eighteen. What's the best advice you've ever received? Now I don't understand the question. When I was 18? Oh, no. In your whole life. Oh, you mean I'm so the number of questions out of the picture now? Yes, it was just to uh, choose which question uh, you got. Uh, oh, you, you I see. I see. Okay. Say it again. What was the best advice ever? What's the best advice you've ever received? That is that is an interesting question because I'm 75 years old. And so I got to bring back a bunch of memories here. Um, wow. There's, there's, there's a lot to choose from. Um, I can't think of the one that I would call the best. That's all I can say. I've received... I've received so many pieces of advice about turn to your creator when you are in trouble. I can't think of anything that could be better advice than that. Me either. That's yeah. wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Barry Krako. This has been an absolute joy. I loved getting to dive into this topic with you. And thank you so much for coming on and sharing with everyone. You're welcome. It was great to be here. If you enjoyed that episode with Dr. Barry Graco, make sure to subscribe and come back next week for another interview with another amazing guest. Thank you so much for listening. Have a beautiful day.